HIMARS, the High Mobility Artillery Rocket System. You have been hearing about it for almost a year now, because it became Ukraine's MVP against Russia's invasion. How it reached that status, though, might not be obvious. After all, the A stands for artillery, and you can find artillery basically everywhere. But HIMARS is different, and its potential successor in Ukraine threatens to upend the slowdown in the war. That's why, in today's video, I want to take a brief look at the history of HIMARS, its key features, Ukraine's HIMARS strategy and how Russia has tried to counter it, the still untapped potential of HIMARS, how a new entrant to the battlefield called Storm Shadow may fill in that gap, and why Russia is uniquely vulnerable to the system, despite its still restricted implementation. Oh, and I guess we'll have a cameo from Pythagoras. Hope you like geometry? But we start with the history of HIMARS. The reason that many people had never heard of HIMARS before the war is because the system is relatively new. Its main forebearer is the MLRS, or Multiple Launch Rocket System, which takes some of the same armaments as HIMARS. The MLRS is hardy but slow. You can tell by how it has a track system, like a tank would. That is because it was designed in the 1970s for a long, drawn-out slugfest with the Soviet Union. But as the Cold War drew to a close, the Department of Defense speculated that the future of U.S. conflicts would center around short, rapid deployments. In that regard, the MLRS was lacking. It is clunky and uses enormous and expensive C-5 Galaxy planes as transport. Essentially, the U.S. Army demanded a sleeker, downsized version of the MLRS. The American experience in the Gulf War validated this belief, and so HIMARS got the full green light. The first tests occurred just months later at the White Sands Missile Range. However, research and development do not occur overnight. Lockheed Martin received the main contract for prototypes in 1996, with the Army and Marines receiving evaluation models in 2001 and 2003, respectively. If you check your calendars, you will see that this pushed operational deployment past the start dates of U.S. major combat operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. The United States has not been involved in large-scale ground deployments since then, which is why it likely evaded public awareness. That is fitting, because HIMARS is generally good at evasion, but we'll get to that. Nevertheless, HIMARS got plenty of reps fighting insurgencies in Afghanistan and Iraq, and had some bonus deployments to Syria. But its spotlight would have to wait a few more years for Ukraine. So why is HIMARS so powerful? Let's talk about a major problem that traditional artillery has. The issue is heft. Unlike small arms fire, when you launch, you risk lighting yourself up like a Christmas tree. That goes double when you are firing rockets and kicking up all sorts of dust. If you are not careful, opposing artillery might fire back at you. HIMARS has two defenses against this. The first is range. There are two main armaments that HIMARS uses. The first is Gimlers, or the Guided Multiple Launch Rocket System. The second has the fantastic nickname of ATACMS, or the Army Tactical Missile System. They are very different on the range spectrum. As a reference point, let's use Kherson, back under Ukrainian control since November 2022. Gimlers have a range of about 80 kilometers, or 50 of my precious freedom units. Atakums has Gimlers beat here. They go up to 300 kilometers, or 190 miles. The trade-off is in quantity. HIMARS can hold six Gimlers. However, there is only room for one Atakums. Gimlers are also more accurate, but both are guided. In any case, the point here is that you can be very far away from your target, and, with any luck, also far away from opposing artillery, as you fire. However, the distance factor is not what makes HIMARS unique. Instead, it is speed. 
look closer at HIMARS versus the older MLRS. Remember how the MLRS had tracks? That wasn't good enough for HIMARS, so they gave it wheels. Thus, assuming you have a road in front of you, once you fire your rockets, you can book it out of there at a maximum speed of 85 kilometers per hour. Combine that with the system's range. This is why, according to the Department of Defense, Russia has not destroyed a single HIMARS system. The fact that HIMARS is basically a fancy truck also makes it easier to deliver to the combat zone. You can charter yourself the workhorse C-130 plane, drive it on board, take off, drive it off once you've landed, and then head over to the firing site, which in this case is the eastern portions of Ukraine. Basically, the US Army decided to live on Easy Street. What does Ukraine do once the launchers have arrived at their destinations? Let's turn our attention to the strategy of HIMARS attacks. The primary use of HIMARS is to shape the battlefield in preparation for a conventional assault. This was a major part of Ukraine's fall 2022 counterattacks, as we have discussed before, and it figures to be a major part of the spring 2023 counterattacks. To visualize the situation, let's look at a conveniently rectangular battle space, and before anyone says that this is a completely inappropriate way to think about war, remember that wargaming departments literally do this full-time with taxpayer dollars, precisely because thinking about simple models helps you better understand the real world. Anyway, the advantage of playing defense is that you can better exploit cover, precisely because you are stationary. The advantage of playing offense is that you get to choose which point on the front lines you want to attack. We'll assume that there are five potential battle sites, each perhaps 60 kilometers apart. As we have discussed before, the defender's goal is to balance the probability of winning across the entire front line. That is because overinvestments in one area are rendered irrelevant because the attacker simply advances on the weaker target. Beyond the more visually apparent forward-deployed soldiers, Russian planners have other considerations when prepping defensive fortifications. Key to today's discussion, you also need to spread out your supply depots. That way, once the battle begins, you can replenish your bullets, light artillery, or whatever else, no matter where the attack is coming from. Putting your depots directly on the front lines would be a bad idea, both because that makes them an easy target, and because if you lose the battle, suddenly all of that metal becomes the property of the enemy and can be used against you. So you push it back a little bit, say 20 kilometers. This is step one of HIMARS. The United States shipped over HIMARS equipped with the shorter range but more precise Gimler's rockets. Ukraine drove the systems eastward, lined up their shots, and lit up the targets within range. As disorganized as Russia's initial invasion was, local commanders got the idea and implemented three countermeasures. First, for supplies that had to stay close to the front lines, Russia decentralized their operations. More but smaller depots could still be hit, but a single successful strike would not completely handicap local Russian soldiers. Second, recently Russia has tried jamming the HIMARS guidance systems. This is a good strategy if you really do not want to lose your supply depot, and also do not care much if the surrounding areas get hit accidentally instead. However, there are counter-counter measures to this, and the United States says that the jamming has not caused much of an issue. In any case, Russia's main solution was to pull back the major stockpiles past 80 kilometers and outside of Gimler's range. Russia had some wiggle room there because it is a bad idea for Ukraine to drive HIMARS to the exact front lines. They are valuable and not completely immune to opposing artillery, but you get the idea. Ukraine could no longer get a leg up by destroying those targets, but such an arrangement permanently helped Ukraine by straining the longer Russian supply lines and delaying replenishment to Russians under the gun. Just how much does Ukraine benefit from this? You might say by 80 kilometers for each site, 
or 80 minus whatever the original distance was. And if we focus on just one of them, that is indeed true, but just for that battle site's main resupply depot. However, remember that the offense is going to be focusing its efforts on one of the target sites. Given that, the neighboring depots must reorient themselves to help the trenches under fire. Before HIMARS, each secondary hub was 60 kilometers away. Post HIMARS, the secondary depots need to traverse 100 kilometers. Thanks, Pythagoras. That, of course, is the best case scenario for Russia, because it assumes that a hypotenuse road exists. If it does not, then every Russian depot is on the hook for the full extra 80 kilometers. That takes us to the second level of HIMARS. If you cannot hit the targets, hit the infrastructure. For example, if you hit this road, now the secondary depot has to go around the square. Or better yet, have HIMARS target this road. Now the main depot is no longer the main depot at all. The other supply route is the fastest, at 100 kilometers, while the previously main one is 160 kilometers away. Or even better, if a river flows between the sites, disable the bridges and cripple the resupply entirely. That was basically the Ukrainian strategy with its siege on Kherson back in the fall of 2022. If you make these three bridges impassable, you effectively put all of the Russian troops back in the city on a de facto island with no resupply. What's more, HIMARS can create infrastructure problems that did not exist before. Imagine that prior to HIMARS, supply depots could be built north of the river. There are many roads out of there, so attacking the infrastructure would not help Ukraine much. But force the depots south of the river, and you create an easy choke point to hammer. There is another step in this strategy that Ukraine has not yet received the opportunity to exploit. Remember how I said that all of this was the consequence of Gimler's? That is because the United States has yet to supply the longer-range attackums. If that were to ever happen, we would see the previous two levels cycle through a second time. That is, Ukraine would surprise Russia with the new systems, lighting up the depots located 80 kilometers away. Then Russia would move some things back to 300 kilometers, though at this point, the depots would be so far away that they would be of little use for actual resupply. So instead, you would just see a lot more decentralization at far distances. Then Ukraine could look for new roads to strike to exacerbate the travel times, both with Gimlers and Attackums. The reason that Washington has not shipped over Attackums yet is because of concerns about escalation risks with Russia. The United States is perfectly pleased to have Ukraine hit Russian targets on Ukrainian soil. But the defense community is less keen on Ukraine using American artillery to strike on Russian soil. And to be clear with the territorial distinctions, we are talking about internationally recognized Russia, not what appears in recently drafted Russian law. If Ukraine wants to have drones or its own artillery hit those targets, so be it. And Kyiv has been busy doing just that. But Washington is concerned that if American attackums hit internationally recognized Russia, then Moscow might retaliate by striking U.S. targets as they attempt to make deliveries. Right now, the way it works is that the United States will drive its aid close to the border, inside a NATO allies country. Ukraine then crosses the border, picks up the goods, and drives home. This is done intentionally so the United States cannot get hit by a Russian missile, intentionally or unintentionally, inside a country actively at war. Rewinding, the United States' specific concern is that Russia might retaliate to an attackums on Russian soil by striking at the exchange sites. This is a big problem because we are in Poland. Combine that location with American casualties, and you have all of the makings for the invocation of the North Atlantic Treaty's Article 5, the provision on collective security. And while that is still many steps removed from a true nuclear catastrophe, it is a road that Washington would prefer not to have to walk down. 
Of course, there are still plenty of Russian targets west of the border. So why doesn't Washington provide attackums under the condition that they only be used in that manner? The standard international relations problem of anarchy does not explain things. Although it remains true that Joe Biden could not call a world police to arrest Zelensky for breaking the agreement, the United States and Ukraine can make the deal self-enforcing if they wanted to. Not all of the attackums would be delivered at once. If Ukraine were to violate the deal, the United States could respond by simply ending the attackums donation program. I do not see an obvious answer to this critique, but here are a few possibilities. For one, even if the government of Ukraine would have no plans to go across the border, as its high-level officials have indicated, there is always some risk of an overzealous operator accidentally or intentionally doing so. A slightly different, but perhaps more likely version of this, is that it limits Russia's ability to craft a false flag attack and claim that Washington was ultimately responsible. The Kremlin has tried playing this blame game once before, following the drone strikes over the Senate building, which may have already been a false flag attack. This is advantageous for selling the war to domestic audiences within Russia as being a struggle against NATO and not just Ukraine. It is hard to say how effective that messaging was domestically regarding the Senate drones, but it definitely failed internationally. Claims of an artillery strike would similarly fall on deaf ears now. But if an attackums transfer program were to begin, then Moscow might start getting some traction with that kind of claim. Another issue is that there is likely a significant cost difference. Obtaining accurate numbers is difficult, but the U.S. Army appears to spend $168,000 per Gimler's rocket as of 2023. The cost of an Attackums rocket is more nebulous. Back in 1998, the United States was paying $820,000 per shot. Adjusted for inflation, that is $1.5 million. U.S. taxpayers would hope that cost has come down over time. But regardless, Attackums commands a large premium over Gimler's. The United States may simply figure that Gimler's provides more bang for the buck. Reinforcing that on a tactical level, Attackums are easier to shoot down. The normal solution to that problem is to simply fire more of them. But given the cost, and the fact that the United States does not have enormous stockpiles of attackums, that does not sound appealing. Another alternative is to use decoy missiles. Ukraine has already implemented this strategy, using ADM-160s to keep Russian defenses busy while the real bombs strike. But because HIMARS can only fire one attackums at a time, to fully take advantage of any kind of decoy, you would need to have more launch vehicles firing more attackums. That begins running into new supply shortages because there just aren't that many launch platforms. Nevertheless, May 2023 saw Ukraine receive a worthy substitute for attackums, the Storm Shadow. These come courtesy of the United Kingdom. No, not that Prime Minister. There you go. Storm Shadow missiles are a joint British-French production. Unlike HIMARS, they are air-to-surface weapons, rather than surface-to-surface. -surface. Nevertheless, they fit Ukraine's need for a longer-range option. The export version of Storm Shadow maxes out at around 250 kilometers. Looking at a map, that extends Ukraine's reach deep into the Crimean Peninsula, and approaching the all-important Crimean Bridge. It is worth noting that the non-export version would get there. A Ukrainian counterattack to the Sea of Azov would also do the job with room to spare. And remember, these are air-to-surface missiles, so you could schedule a bold flight over Russian-held territory, fire the Storm Shadow after closing the gap, and then return to base. Aside from range, another advantage Storm Shadow provides over Gimler's is that it can penetrate hardened sites. That is important because Russia has been frantically fortifying its facilities for fortnights. And that might be all that the Kremlin can do. This was how far Russia had to pull back under Attackums. Storm Shadow only provides a small break to Russia by comparison. 
the distance is still far enough that Russia will have to rely on decentralized hubs, which will need some level of additional defense to hedge Russian bets. Still, Storm Shadow has problems just like the Atakums. Russia already claims to be shooting them down. We do not know whether that is true. In contrast to Atakum's Mach 3 speed, Storm Shadow is subsonic, and slower things are easier to shoot down. The trade-off is that Storm Shadow does not fly up here, but rather down here at about 35 meters off the ground. Low-altitude missiles evade radar and are more difficult to intercept. For perspective, this is the backside of Red Square at that altitude. Notice the flagpole above the Kremlin Senate that was the target of the drone attack actually rises above the Shadow Storm trajectory. Regardless of Russia's proven or unproven ability to intercept them, Ukraine is using some of those aforementioned decoys to help Storm Shadows reach their targets. The main dilemma, though, is the limited supply. According to official parliamentary questions from 2011, each Storm Shadow missile costs 790,000 pounds. Today, the number I see floating around is 2 million pounds, though that does not seem to have a firm source, and it would be odd for them to cost twice as much today when weapons systems are supposed to get cheaper over time. But whatever the true number is, Ukraine will have to be judicious in selecting its targets. Meanwhile, Russia is vocalizing that Westminster has begun an unacceptable escalation, but there has not been much in the way of meaningful consequences yet, and who knows what Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov means by adequate. That wraps up the surface strategy. Now let's cover why Russia is uniquely vulnerable to HIMARS and Storm Shadow. I know what you're thinking. Calm down, lines on map sky. It's just Russia building new facilities and driving a little longer. You just like it because it means the lines on maps get longer. But for Russia, overcoming these problems is actually going to be super easy, barely an inconvenience. However, that philosophy understates how active war zones complicate even simple tasks. It just so happens that the Kremlin's necessary solutions to the high Mars problems play right into Russia's major underlying vulnerabilities. If we had to summarize why Ukraine survived the initial invasion, it would be Russian corruption and lack of soldier motivation. And unlike simply moving supplies outside of an opponent's artillery range, there is no simple fix to those problems. They are at the very core of Russian institutions, and it will take years, or decades, before we start seeing significant improvements. Remember how the Kyiv convoy failed in part because equipment started breaking down? That was because, by mining metal out of materiel, Russians rapidly raked in rubles. Or they just siphoned the fuel out of their vehicles to sell on the black market. Or their engines imploded because it was much easier for the unmotivated army mechanic to say that he was performing maintenance when he was actually socializing with his comrades. Or perhaps the tires blew out because the procurement officer realized that he could buy cheap knockoff tires and pocket the difference. The point here is that those extra kilometers that you and I would treat as a minor waste of time if we were on a road trip are actually gigantic headaches for Russian logistics. Meanwhile, Russia's other solution, decentralization, plays into its weakness with oversight. If you are worried that enlisted soldiers and misbehaving officers are not going to be doing their jobs, then the solution is to have more trusted officers monitor their behavior. But if your trusted officers are few and far between, you become dependent on economies of scale. That is, you want to use one officer to oversee a large number of comrades all at once. Decentralization goes exactly against those economies of scale. Worse, high-ranking officers really do not want to be going to places where rockets might be falling on them from the sky. As a result, the monitoring of all of those inner locations may be scant, allowing the enlisted soldiers and corrupt officers alike to find new and interesting ways to sell off goods for a profit. Gimler's has already demonstrated these effects. If Storm Shadow takes over the battlefield, 
everything will just get further decentralized and pushed back. And one imagines that more vehicles will break down, and more rubles will get siphoned away. What will the soldiers do with all those rubles? Perhaps they will want to know more about why they find themselves west of the Ukrainian border and what caused the war. Check below for more information on that. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care. Let me preface this by saying that Google Earth is a fantastic program. Hats off to the team that makes it. I especially appreciate how the team pays attention to the news and will create 3D models soon after something is trending. Their rendering of the International Criminal Court, which I featured in the video on Putin's warrant, is great and just feels real. So too does this model of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the one that Russia captured at the start of the war. But I have noticed some odd quirks. As I was creating the ICC video, I noticed that Google Earth updated its rendering mid-recording. Apparently a building from what appears to be the 1970s was teleported on top of the ICC, no doubt as part of an elaborate escape plan by some guilty party. However, the reason I am talking about this today is something that has been bothering me over Moscow. I don't know what this building slash UFO is, and I don't know how it got 537 feet off the ground. But either someone screwed up over at Google, or Russia has mastered the science behind anti-gravity. And if it's the latter, well, Ukraine's in deep trouble.